Support for this program comes from listeners like you. To find out more, visit us online at chipbrogdon.com. Mark chapter 15, part 1, with a message titled, And They Crucified Him. So we have followed the ministry, the earthly ministry, the journey of Jesus throughout the Gospel of Mark. And so we find that this journey is, has now brought us to Jerusalem and that the confrontation between the Spirit of Jesus and and the spirit of religion is now coming to a a mighty climax and in this this last great confrontation between Jesus and the religious system we're going to learn and we're going to see and experience the wisdom of God in the crucifixion of Christ but also the wisdom of God in that Jesus himself calls his disciples to take up the cross daily and follow after him. So we'll talk about what that means, how it applies to you and to me. And it's my goal not just to convey the historical record, which Mark does so well, of the death, the crucifixion and the death of, of Jesus, but to convey the spiritual and prophetic significance of these things in a way that is practical and applicable to you and to me as disciples of Jesus. So we will divide up and we'll do this in a couple of messages. We'll do part one today and then next session we will cover part two, roughly the uh, second half of Mark 15. So let's look at the first part. Uh, Mark 15, part 1, and we'll look at three sections. First, we'll talk about the hidden wisdom, because I want to lay kind of a spiritual foundation for what we are discussing and why it matters and how it applies. So we'll discuss the hidden wisdom, and then we'll take a look at Christ before Pilate, and then we will look at the scourging and crucifixion of Christ. Well, let's begin not with Mark 15. We will end up there, and you are certainly welcome to hold your place there in Mark 15. But I want to begin in 1 Peter. If you return to 1 Peter... And so, as I said, my concern is that we that we always look to the spiritual, the prophetic application and practical meaning of what it is that we are studying so that we're not just looking at stories in a book, history, things that happened in the past, but we are looking for the prophetic and spiritual significance of those things. And as I said in, in my rhetorical question, why did Jesus have to die? And I know the textbook answer to that. I, I, I know that the proper answer, the usual answer is, well, he died for the sins of the world. He died to save us and to uh, redeem us. And of course, that is certainly correct. But I believe and I teach what I call a two-fold work of the cross. And I think a lot of people embrace the first aspect of the cross, uh, but they do not necessarily understand the two-fold work of the cross. And it's the second aspect of the cross that uh, certainly has very real implications and applications to you and to me. Uh, and I, I want to illustrate this in First Peter chapter 2, and we'll begin reading in verse 20. For what credit is it if, when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, 
If you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. So Peter here is writing to Christians who are being persecuted, people uh, who are suffering for their faith, real suffering, not imaginary suffering, not suffering that's just made up in their head, but they're actually being persecuted for their faith in Jesus. So Peter says, when you do good and, and you suffer the way you are suffering, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. In verse 21, for to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree or on the cross, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls." Well, the twofold work of the cross is revealed in verse 21. Now, the first part of that, and I discuss these things in, in my book, Embrace the Cross. And we talk about the twofold work of the cross. And I use 1 Peter 2, 21 as a way to, to illustrate the twofold work of the cross for to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us. That's the first work of the cross. Christ suffered for us. Christ died for us. And for a lot of people, that's good enough for them, and that's all that they are taught. But there is another aspect of the cross in Peter goes on to say that not only did Christ suffer for us, it says, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Christ suffered for us. That's the first work of the cross. Leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. That's the second work of the cross. So in the first place, Jesus died on the cross for me. And in the second place, now I take up the cross and follow in his steps because he left us an example. He died for us, but he also left us an example that we should follow his steps. So that is the twofold work of the cross. And, you know, I would say to you that the first work of the cross because it gets all of the attention and all of the teaching and all the preaching, uh, people are fairly familiar with the fact that Jesus died on the cross, that Jesus died for the sins of the world, that Jesus suffered, uh, he was crucified. And, and there it is right there in the Gospel of Mark, as we'll see. But they don't so much understand or appreciate or have been taught the second fold work of the cross, the twofold work of the cross, that second work, which is not something Jesus does for us, but is something, if I could say it this way, something that we do for him. We're not doing it to earn our salvation by works, it has really nothing to do with salvation. His death on the cross, once and for all, is the sacrifice, the atonement for our sins. John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So it, it, the cross that Jesus died on for us, he suffered for us. It wasn't for him. He wasn't dying for his own sins. He wasn't suffering for himself. Instead, he was, he was suffering for us. So that's pretty evident. That's pretty plain. But the second 
part of the cross here is a, is a little more mysterious, not quite as familiar. But Peter says Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. And what, if you look at the context, what he is talking about is doing good and suffering for it. Doing good and being persecuted for it. Following Jesus and being the object of ridicule. Following the Lord and being misunderstood. Doing good and suffering for it. That's the bottom line. And if you take it patiently, Peter says, this is commendable before God, and this is what you were called to, he says. To this you were called. And so once again, here's why we don't hear a lot about the twofold work of the cross. Because a lot of people, a lot of Christians in particular, let me be blunt, they just use religion to try to make their life easier. And they believe if they pray the right prayer, if they go to the, to the right church, if they confess the right things, God's going to bless them. He's going to provide for them. If they're sick, they'll be healed. If they're poor, they'll be rich. If they're not happy, they'll be happy. And so the idea that we are actually called to do good and suffer actually called to make a stand, actually called to take up the cross and follow in the example of Jesus, that's not something that is very widely taught. And for that reason, it is not something that is very widely known or widely received. It's not what we want to hear. We want to hear how God is delivering us, how God is blessing us, how God is making us great. And I certainly pray for favor and I pray for blessing. And I'm happy when they come. But I, I suppose the difference is I realize that I am not called to greatness. I'm called to follow Jesus. I'm not called to be wealthy. I am called to follow Jesus. I'm not called to be the head. I'm called to follow Jesus. And I'm not called to a life of ease and comfort, free from suffering. I am called to follow Jesus. He suffered for me, leaving me an example that I should follow his steps. And if he died for you, and if he suffered for you, then he also left you an example that you should follow his steps. And that means doing good and being willing to suffer for the good that you do. Or speaking the truth and being willing to suffer for the truth that you speak. So Peter says you have to take it patiently because this is commendable before God. There is no merit. There's no reward. If you suffer and you go through things and you don't take it patiently, if you complain and moan and groan and gripe and bellyache the whole time, then you lose your reward. So Peter says, look to Jesus who suffered for us and left us an example that we should follow his steps. So that is contrary to the wisdom of the world. It's contrary to the wisdom of religion, which teaches that God is here to make your life better. God is here to make you happy. God is here to make you fulfilled. God is here to bless you. And again, I certainly do pray for the blessing of God, but I don't take it for granted. And I, and I don't believe I am entitled to a life free from suffering, free from pain, free from disappointment, free from conflict, But the very path that God leads us, this path of 
following Jesus in his steps. I call it the hidden wisdom because it is something that we have to experience in order to appreciate. And so the hidden wisdom, again outlined in my book, Embrace the Cross, revolves around a few principles that don't make sense to the natural man. It doesn't make sense to the religious man or woman, because the natural man is essentially the same as the religious man. There's really no difference. But the first principle of the hidden wisdom is life out of death. Life out of death. And we see that illustrated for us in Matthew chapter 10, verse 38 and 39, where Jesus says, He who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. So by losing your life, Jesus says, you find your real life. And so the hidden wisdom of God brings life out of death. So we're talking about embracing the cross, which is foolishness to the world, but it is the hidden wisdom. And it's the means through which God brings life out of death. The second principle of the hidden wisdom is wisdom that comes through foolishness. Wisdom comes through foolishness. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6, 7, and 8 help to illustrate this. Paul says, We speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The hidden wisdom is what we're talking about. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So again, we see this hidden wisdom wrapped up in a discussion about the cross and the crucifixion. Had they known it, Paul says they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. And then in chapter 3, verses 18 and 19 of 1 Corinthians, Paul says, Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool, that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. (laughs) For it is written, He catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So the hidden wisdom is all about God bringing wisdom through foolishness. And Paul says, you know, the crucifixion of Jesus, it it seems foolishness. How can God achieve his purpose by allowing Christ, the Son of God, to be crucified? Crucified in weakness, Paul says, and yet raised. And that's that's why you have to understand that to embrace the cross, we're not just embracing the crucifixion, but we are embracing a necessary step that leads to resurrection and new life. That's what we're doing. But it's the the hidden wisdom, and you don't get to the resurrection unless you go through the crucifixion. Well, that is, again, part of the hidden wisdom and principle number three that I call strength through weakness. Strength through weakness. And this is illustrated in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. And this is Paul discussing the thorn in the flesh that he prayed three times that Lord the Lord would take this weakness away from him, a messenger of Satan, a thorn in the flesh, He says, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Because Paul, just like everybody else, we don't want weakness. We want strength. We don't want sickness. We want healing. We don't want to struggle with our finances. We want to be blessed. And we don't want to be happy, unhappy, and unfulfilled. We want to be happy. We want to have 
good relationships and work in the right job and have a, a, a blessed existence. But there's going to be in your life thorns in the flesh. There's going to be messengers of Satan come to buffet you. And they, they come in a lot of different shapes and sizes and varieties. <laughs> These thorns in the flesh. So naturally, Paul says, I don't want this. And he goes to the Lord and he prays. And today we might go on Facebook and ask for people to pray for us, to take this thorn of the flesh away from us or call the prayer chain or get someone that we feel um, is prophetic or spiritual or maybe call the pastor to lay hands on us and pray for us that this thorn in the flesh would be taken away from us because we don't want this weakness. We don't want this thing that is testing us. We want it to go away from here. But Paul did not get the answer that he prayed for. And so we shouldn't wonder when we don't get the answer that we pray for. Paul prayed for this thorn in the flesh, this messenger of Satan, to be removed, and he prayed three times. But the Lord said to him in verse 9, My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And that's the hidden wisdom. I'll not take away the weakness, but I will reveal my strength my grace that strengthens you even in the midst of weakness. And then Paul says, therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You see, we want the power of Christ, but we don't want the weakness. We want the glory and the blessing and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit of Pentecost, of Pentecost but we don't want the crucifixion. And the suffering and the death of the cross. But the strength is not made perfect in strength. His strength is made perfect in weakness. Now this should be good news. Because most of us are weak. We're just putting up a facade of strength that really isn't there anyway. So we can stop pretending and we can just go to the Lord as we are. And we can go to each other as we are. And instead of trying to be the most spiritual, strongest person in the room, we can just say, like Paul, I've got weaknesses. And I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He goes on to say in verse 10, therefore, I take pleasure in in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs. He takes pleasure in his needs. Now, we opened up this session praying for God to meet our needs. Paul says, I have needs that are not met. He says, I have infirmities that God hasn't healed, reproaches, persecutions, distresses. For Christ's sake. For when I am weak, he says, then I am strong. Why? Because of what the Lord said. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, there's no perfection in the weakness of sin or the weakness of stupidity. Being a fool for Christ is different from just being a fool. So we don't want to be foolish and we don't want to be stupid because then uh, we are just basically reaping what we have sown. But the idea here is that we're suffering for the Lord. We're suffering for the testimony of Jesus. We're not suffering because of the, of the stupid things we've done or the bad habits that we don't let go or the sin that we don't forsake. That's not what Paul is talking about. That's not what Peter is talking about. And those things don't represent the kind of suffering. And they're not going to lead to the blessing in the suffering. We have to forsake those things. 
But what we're talking about here is a principle of the hidden wisdom, that the very things coming against us, trying to to destroy us and make us weaker, they can actually make us stronger if we understand how to apply the hidden wisdom. When I am weak, then I am strong. Because it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is Christ in you doing what you can't do on your own. And the the problem is we still think we can do so many things on our own. And what Paul had to learn is the same thing that we have to learn. That apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. Well, that's just part of the principle of the cross within the hidden wisdom of God. And the fourth is greatness comes from being the least. Greatness comes from being the least. And that is certainly illustrated by Jesus in his approach to the cross. Luke fourteen eleven. He said, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. He says, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. And it says in Philippians 2 that because Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of a cross, that God has highly exalted him. So the greatest exaltation came from the greatest humility, the greatest humility of Christ being crucified, beaten, crucified, naked on the cross. That great, that greatest humiliation turned into the greatest exaltation when God highly exalted him and gave him a name above all names that at the name of Jesus every knee must bow of things in heaven, earth, and under the earth, and every tongue must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It says in Ephesians 1 that God has exalted him and given him a name, raised him up, and that his name is greater than every other name in this age and in the age to come. And all of that came by embracing the cross because he humbled himself. God highly exalted him. So that's the hidden wisdom that the path to go higher is actually going to take us lower. We go low to go high. (laughs) But all who exalt themselves, they're going to be humbled. They're going to be brought low. So my approach is you're going to be brought low one way or the other. Either you're going to exalt yourself and experience the pain of being humbled, or you can humble yourself, embrace the cross, and in due season, God will raise you up and glorify you. Maybe not in this age, but certainly in the age to come. When we enter the kingdom of God and we rule and reign with Christ and with all others who have learned the hidden wisdom that greatness comes from being the least. That if you want to be the first, you have to be the last. And if you want to rule, you have to be the servant. So all of these things are part of the hidden wisdom. It's all part of following in the footsteps of Jesus. And then the fifth and the final principle that I teach from the hidden wisdom is prosperity from poverty prosperity from poverty and this is illustrated for us in second corinthians chapter 6 beginning in verse 10 as sorrowful yet always rejoicing as poor yet making many rich as having nothing and yet possessing all things and paul here is referring to his his own apostolic ministry But he has also applied that to Jesus, crucified in weakness and yet raised by the power of God. And through his poverty, it says that he made others rich. 
Now, I hope you don't take that to mean that God is going to bless you with a fat bank account and a Lincoln Cadillac to drive around. That's worldly and um, and carnal. <laughs> I mean, if you want to go out and work and earn money, that's the fruit of your labor. If that's how you want to to do it, then be my guest. But the idea that you can pray or you can um, expect God to give you a 100-fold return. If you put a dollar in the plate, God's going to give you $100 back. And if you put that $100 in, then you're going to get 10000 back or whatever. Uh, it, it's just it's carnal. And, and the New Age people do the same thing. They just call it manifesting. It's the same thing religious people do. They call it you know, confession. Confess and possess is what the prosperity gospel refers to it. New Age folks, they just call it manifesting. And but but it's the same principle, and um, it doesn't work. However, you slice it, and again, if you want to go out and work and and earn your money, you have a right to do that, and um, and you should do that. But the idea that uh, God or anybody else is just going to hand you riches based on scriptures or based on confessions or based on manifesting anything is uh, it's a ridiculous notion. Well, the hidden wisdom is not that we become rich by trying to accumulate, but that we become wealthy by giving away. And I'm primarily primarily referring to spiritual wealth. But you can take any application that you want. Jesus says it's more blessed to give than to receive. A lot of people will disagree with that. They'll say it's certainly more blessed to receive. <laughs> and that's what they want. And their whole prayer life is about getting, getting, getting from God. Well, the hidden wisdom says we become rich in proportion to what we give away. That true wealth and true prosperity doesn't come from accumulation. It comes from giving away. And that's why Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit for the whole kingdom of God belongs to them. So again, we see these little nuggets of the hidden wisdom illustrated in the cross and illustrated throughout scripture. And so the point is, back to 1 Peter 2, the twofold work of the cross is this. Jesus died for us and he left us an example to follow. Jesus died for us. And he left us an example to follow. Not that we should die for the sins of the world. That, that's not the example. The example is to show us that we, in, when we embrace the cross, God will make life out of death. God will bring wisdom through foolishness. God will bring strength through weakness. God will bring greatness from being least. And God will bring prosperity from poverty. So the purpose of all of this is not just to experience the suffering of crucifixion, but the blessing of resurrection. But you can't get to Resurrection Sunday unless you go through Crucifixion Friday. So keep that in mind as we now go back to Mark 15 and begin reading in verse 1. Immediately in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus, led him away, and delivered him to Pilate. Then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered and said to him, It is as you say. And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. Then Pilate asked him again, saying, Do you answer nothing? See how many things they testify against you. But Jesus still answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Now, why would Pilate marvel? Because most people, and I put myself in the category of most people, when we are being accused falsely, or even when we are being accused truthfully, the natural response is what? Defend myself. 
argue, defend, justify, go back on the attack, turn it around. And there's this thing that rises up within us that compels us to defend ourselves. So the amazing thing is that Jesus was silent and Pilate marveled. Then in verse 6, now at the feast, he was accustomed to releasing one prisoner to them, whomever they requested. And there was one named Barabbas, who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder in the rebellion. Then the multitude, crying aloud, began to ask him to do just as he had always done for them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd so that he should rather release Barabbas to them. Pilate answered and said to them again, What then do you want me to do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? So they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said to him, Why, what evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. So we're going to talk about three aspects of the cross here as we consider the portion that we have just read, the silence of the cross, the substitution of the cross, and the suffering of the cross. And to help illustrate that, we're going to also consider some verses from Isaiah 53 to help support this. But um, point number one, the silence of the cross is revealed when Jesus said nothing in response to the accusations made against him. Jesus said nothing. He was silent. And if you've, I'm sure you've probably read Isaiah chapter 53, but it is so remarkable that Jesus was silent that it became something that Isaiah specifically mentions in his messianic prophecy, Isaiah 53, verse 7, keeping in mind that this was written hundreds, centuries, hundreds of years, centuries before it was actually fulfilled when Jesus stood before Pilate. In Isaiah 53, 7, it says that he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. So there's a lot there in Isaiah 53 that we could delve into, but I'm just wanting to focus on the silence of the cross. So how do we know that we are really embracing the cross and really following in the footsteps of Jesus? Well, one way is to see how patiently and how silently we bear whatever it is that we have to bear without complaint, without moaning and groaning, without defending ourselves, without lashing out. But Jesus silently embraced the cross. And I want you to see that he is embracing the principle of the cross long before he is physically crucified on the cross. You and I will probably never be crucified on an actual cross, but we may still take up the cross and follow Jesus and follow in his steps, follow his example by by embracing that silence. The silence, the silence of the cross. Well, the second is the substitution of the cross. And this is revealed in Jesus actually taking the place of Barabbas. And so it's interesting that that name Barabbas, it says that he was a rebel and also a murderer. But Barabbas actually means father's son or son of a father or son of a master. Bar means son of. 
Abba is father. So his name is actually father's son. So isn't that an interesting juxtaposition? Barabbas, also a father's son, and Jesus, the son of God, side by side. But this Barabbas, I believe, prophetically and spiritually represents Adam. And in Luke 4, it says that Adam was the son of God in the sense that Adam was created. And so in a way, Barabbas here represents Adam, which in Adam all die, it says, but in Christ all will be made alive. But it was Jesus taking the place of Barabbas and Barabbas going free that really illustrates how all of fallen humanity was kind of summed up in Barabbas, a rebel, a murderer, whose name means father's son. And he rebelled against the Lord. He rebelled against the commandments. And it says that Adam brought death upon all. So in a way, Barabbas is kind of uh, representative of Adam, also a son of God who rebelled and who brought death to all. And here is Jesus taking the place of Barabbas and Barabbas going free. So that is the substitution of the cross. Isaiah 53, 12 refers to it when Isaiah says, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. Well, to intercede is to stand in the gap. And this is what Jesus is doing, standing in the gap and taking the place of Barabbas, who is going to be released, And Jesus, who had done no evil, taking his place, making intercession for the transgressors. The third thing we see, we see illustrated in Mark 15 is the suffering of the cross. And it's pretty evident. It's revealed when Jesus is being mocked, beaten, whipped, and spat upon. And that is also something that Isaiah makes mention of. Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5 say, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, it says in verse 6. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus took away the sins of the world, not our sins only, but the sins of the whole world. Why? Because Isaiah says we have turned every one to his own way. See, it, it's it's easy for us to imagine all those lost people in the world going astray, and we've come home, and God's happy with us, but God's angry with them. But we fail to truly appreciate that it wasn't just Adam who brought death upon all mankind, and it's like we're innocent victims. Isaiah says, all of us like sheep have gone astray. And then he says, we have turned everyone, each one of us, has gone his own way. All of us are in the place of Barabbas. All of us have rebelled. All of us, each one of us, have turned aside to his own way. So it's not just that Adam did something and we are the unfortunate recipients of something that is not our fault. Isaiah says all of us like sheep have gone astray and each one of us has turned aside to his own way. And I would suggest to you that is the very battle that we face constantly is turning every one of us to our way instead of his way. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. 
whether it is indulging in some sin that you know that you should forsake and put away, whether it is moaning and groaning groaning against your circumstances, whether it is expecting something from God, not getting it, and then being disappointed. All of us have turned everyone to his own way. We get frustrated and upset and bitter. And it all has to do with we don't get what we want. We don't get our way, and so we become offended. And Isaiah says, every one of us have turned aside to our own way. And the point is that that iniquity, that rebellion, and the price for that was laid on him. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So all of us are included in that. So how does this apply to us as we follow in in the steps of Jesus? As we take up the cross, we're not taking up the cross for the sins of the world. So how does it apply to us? Well, I believe, and here's how I would put it, to follow in his steps is to resist, is not to resist or rebel. To follow in his steps is not to resist or rebel, but to silently accept the will of God, to stand in the gap for all the children of Adam who have gone astray and to rejoice that we are worthy to suffer shame for his name. In other words, the silence of the cross, the substitution of the cross, the suffering of the cross, it's all possible, it's all made possible, and it's all done for love because we love God And we love God's will more than our will. We love God's way more than our way. I am sick and tired of my way, and I want his way. And we have to get to that point in our life. Instead of always trying to get God to come around to our point of view, trying to get God to do things the way we want them, trying to get God to lead us in the way that we want to go, it's giving all of that up. And saying, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. The silence, the substitution, the suffering. Embracing it. And the only way you can do it, and I've mentioned this in the last few teachings, I just think it's so important as we consider taking up the cross and following after Jesus. It's not a contest to see who's got the most self-control. It's not to see who can do the most for God. It's not to see who's the strongest. But we do what we do because of the great love that we have for God and for other people. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our heart. And that's what makes all of this worthwhile. And that's where the power comes from. Jesus endured the things that he endured not from a sense of religious duty, but because he loved God and because he loved God's will more than his own will. So this is the principle of the cross. And then we come again back to Mark chapter 15. In verse 16, Then the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole garrison, and they clothed him with purple And they twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they struck him on the head with a reed and spat on him, and bowing the knee they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon a Cyrenian, the the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the the country and passing by to bear his cross. And they brought him to the place of, to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. Then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour 
and they crucified him. So just a few observations here as we close out this part one of the teaching. Roman scourging was done with strips of leather embedded with bits of bone and metal. And so the idea is to wound and to make uh, deep cuts. And certainly uh, make the victim bleed as much as possible. Now, th there is a thing that I have heard people talk about and try to apply in this situation, the law of 39 stripes. And it's a law, it's not a well-known law, but it, it is scriptural that the purpose of scourging in a Jewish uh, community, in a Jewish synagogue at the time, was to restore the person, not to, to punish the person. And they set a limit of 39 stripes and, and no more than that because God said any more than that and you would despise this person. They would become despised in your eyes. And so there was a limit up to 39 stripes in, in Jewish law. But uh, th that doesn't apply to Jesus because there's no Roman law. It's the Romans that are are whipping him. It's not the Jews. And there's no Roman law that protected non-Romans from how severely they could be beaten. So it's, it's very likely that he was beaten with uh, many more than 39 stripes. But we know that it was very severe because it was customary to bear your own cross. Everyone, uh, the, those that were crucified with him bore their own cross. But Jesus was beaten so badly that he could not bear that cross himself. And so Simon of Cyrene was compelled by the soldiers to carry the cross of Jesus. So that gives us an idea of how severe that beating was. Now, Jesus bore all these things silently for the love of God. And when we take up the cross, we can do the same with that, with the same strength and spirit of Jesus to empower us, whatever it is that we're facing So remember back in the garden, in the garden of Gethsemane, in prayer, Jesus asked, just the way Paul asked three times for this thorn in the flesh to be taken away from him. When Jesus prayed, he also sought for this to be taken from him, this cup. He sought for another way besides the cross. But he said, not my will, but your will be done. And once God revealed his will, Jesus not only accepted the cross, he embraced the cross. And while the cross we bear today has nothing to do with the sins of the world, it doesn't even have anything to do with our own sins. Because Jesus has already paid the price for our sins. We follow in the footsteps of Jesus when we take up the cross daily. And when we embrace the cross, God's power is perfected, not by avoiding difficulties, but by experiencing them. And when we do, we learn that the way of the cross does not end with crucifixion and death, but with resurrection and life. If you'd like to get additional teachings, audio recordings, books, and other Christ-centered resources to help you grow spiritually, visit us online at chipbrogdon.com.